Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bright on Buddhism. This week we will be reading and discussing part 1 of chapter 2 of D.T. Suzuki's translation of the Lankavatara Sutra. The title translates roughly to Discourse on the Descent into Lanka. The text recounts Shakyamuni giving the teaching to a bodhisattva named Mahamati, or Great Wisdom, as they bring the Dharma to the mythical land of Lanka, often interpreted as modern-day Sri Lanka, which is ruled by Ravana, the king of the Rakshasas. The Lankavatara discusses numerous Mahayana concepts, such as Yogacara mind-only doctrine, and the three natures, the Alayavijnana, or the storehouse consciousness, Gotra theory, Buddha nature, the luminous mind, emptiness, and vegetarianism. In chapter 2, Mahamati praises the Buddha, asks the Buddha 108 questions, and is negated 108 times, and is given several important Chan teachings. So before we get started, we're going to define Vijnana and Alaya Vijnana one more time since it's been a while since we've looked at those terms. So Vijnana itself could be understood as a type of consciousness or cognizing. So in the Buddhist system, there are eight Vijnanas or eight consciousnesses. These are the six sense consciousnesses. And then the seventh one is awareness of consciousness. So you're aware that you have these six sense consciousnesses. And then the eighth one is the Alaya Vijnana, and this translates to the storehouse consciousness. In Yogacara thought, and also in early Chan thought, this is where karma is said to live. So all of the experiences that you have over the course of all of your reincarnations plant a karmic seed into this Alaya Vijnana. And this karmic seed can be good, bad, or neutral and it shapes how all the other cognitions are carried out. So if you have a bunch of bad seeds, it's going to lead to bad fruit. Then your overall day-to-day experience is going to be bad. And so the point of Buddhist practice is to purify the bad seeds, plant good seeds, and then eventually, when you become a Buddha, empty out the Alaya Vijnana altogether, so that you're no longer acting or existing in a karmic fashion. So it's kind of a very complicated elaboration on the fifth aggregate, which is consciousness or mind. We hope you enjoy. Chapter 2 At that time, Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva who had visited all the Buddha lands, together with all the Bodhisattvas, rose from his seat by the power of the Buddhas, drawing his upper garment over one shoulder, placing his right knee on the ground, and with folded hands, turning in the direction of the Blessed One, respectfully saluted him and praised him with the following verses. As thou reviewest the world with thy transcendental knowledge and compassion, it is to thee like an ethereal flower, of which one cannot say whether it is born or destroyed, as the category of being and non-being is inapplicable to it. As thou reviewest all things with thy transcendental knowledge and compassion, they are to thee like visions. They are beyond the reach of intellectual grasp, as the category of being and non-being is inapplicable to them. As thou reviewest the world with thy transcendental knowledge and compassion, it is to thee always like a dream, of which one cannot say whether it is permanent or destructible, as the category of being and non-being is inapplicable to it. In the Dharmakaya, whose self-nature is like a vision or a dream, what is there to praise? When no thought arises as to existence or as to not having self-nature, then there is praise. Of a thing whose appearance is not visible because of it being beyond the senses and their objects, how can it be praised or blamed, O Muni? With thy transcendental knowledge and compassion, which are above form, thou comprehendest the egolessness of things and persons, and art thyself always clean and free from the hindrances of passion and knowledge. Thou dost not vanish in nirvana, nor is nirvana abiding in thee, for it transcends the duality of knowing and known, and of being and non-being. Those who see the muni so serene and beyond birth and death will be cleansed of attachment, stainless both in this world and in the other. At that time, Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, praising the Blessed One with such verses as these, made his own name known to the Blessed One. I am Mahamati, Blessed One, and am very well versed in the Mahayana. I wish to ask 108 questions of thee who art most eloquent. Hearing his words, the Buddha, the best knower of the world, looking over the whole assembly, spoke to the son of the Sugata thus, Ask me, sons of the victorious, and Mahamati, 
you ask and I will instruct you in self-realization. At that moment, Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, who was given by the Blessed One the opportunity to speak, prostrated himself at the feet of the Blessed One and asked, How can one be cleansed of false intellection? Whence does it arise? How can one perceive errors? Whence do they arise? Whence come lands, transformation, appearance, and philosophers? Wherefore is the state of imagelessness and gradations? And whence are the sons of the victorious? Where is the way of emancipation? Who is in bondage? By what is he redeemed? What is the mental state of those who practice the jhanas? Whence is the triple vehicle? What is that that is born of causation? What is effect? What is cause or that which works? Whence the doctrine of duality? Whence does it arise? Wherefore is the tranquilizing exercise of formlessness and that of complete extinction? Wherefore the extinction of thoughts? And how is one awakened from it? How does action arise? Whence is the behavior of those who hold the body? Whence this visible world? Whence the conditions? Whence the entrance upon the stages? Who is it that breaks through this triple existence? What is the abode? What is the body? Where does that which is abiding arise? Whence comes the son of the Buddha? Who attains the psychic faculties, the self-masteries, the samadhis? How is the mind tranquilized? Pray tell me, O bull-like victor. What is the alaya? And whence the manovijnana? How does the visible world rise? How does it cease from being visible? Whence are families and no families? What is meant by mind only? The setting up of marks. And whence the doctrine of egolessness? Why is there no being? What kind of teaching is in accordance with popular thinking? How can one cease cherishing eternalism and nihilism? How is it that you do not differ from the philosophers as regards appearance? Tell me, whence is the rise of the Nyaya school? Its future. What is meant by emptiness? What do you understand by momentary destruction? Whence is the womb? And whence is the stability of the world? Why is the world like a vision in a dream? How does it resemble the city of the Gandharvas? Why is it to be regarded as like a mirage, or like the moon reflected in the water? Pray tell me. What are the elements of enlightenment? Whence are the constituents of enlightenment? Wherefore is a revolution and the disturbance of a kingdom? And how does the realistic view of existence take its rise? What is meant by the world being above birth and death, or being like the flower in the air? How do you understand it? Why do you regard it as being beyond words? How is it not subject to discrimination? How is it like the sky? Of how many sorts is suchness? How manifold is the mind? How many paramitas are there? Whence is the gradation of the stages? What is the state of imagelessness? Wherefore is the twofold egolessness? How is one cleansed of the hindrance of knowledge? Of how many kinds is knowledge? O leader, how many moral precepts are there? And forms of being? Whence are the families born of gold and jewel and pearl? Of whom is speech born? Whence is the differentiation of beings? Whence are the sciences, offices, and arts? And by whom are they made manifest? Of how many sorts are gathas? What is prose? What is meter? Of how many sorts is reasoning and exegesis? How many varieties of food and drink are there? Whence does sexual desire originate? Whence are there kings, sovereigns, and provincial rulers? How does a king protect his dominion? Of how many groups are heavenly beings? Whence are the earth, stars, constellations, the moon, and the sun? How many kinds of emancipation are there? Of the yogins? How many kinds of discipleship? And how about the masters? How many kinds of Buddhahood are there? And how many of the Jataka tales? How numerous are the evil ones? How numerous are the heretics? What is meant by the doctrine that there is nothing but thought construction? Pray tell me, thou most eloquent one. Whence are the clouds in the sky, the wind? What is meant by recollection, by wisdom? Whence are trees and vines? Pray tell me, Lord of the triple world. How do horses, elephants, and deer get caught? Wherefore are there fools and despicable people? Pray tell me, thou charioteer of the mind. Wherefore are the six seasons mentioned? What is meant by the Achantika, one who is without Buddha nature? Tell me whence is the birth of a man, of a woman, of a hermaphrodite? How does one retrograde in the yoga exercises? How does one make progress in them? 
How many exercises are there? And how are men kept abiding in them? Pray tell me. Beings are born in the various paths of existence. What are their specific marks and forms? How is abundance of wealth acquired? Pray tell me, thou who art like the sky. Whence is the Shakya family? And the one born of Ikshvaku? Whence is the Rishi long penance? What is taught by him? How is it that thou art thus apparent everywhere in every land, surrounded by such bodhisattvas of such various names and forms? Why is meat not to be eaten? Why is it forbidden? Whence was the carnivorous race born? Who eats meat? Why are the lands shaped like the moon, the sun, the sumeru, the lotus, the swastika, and the lion? Pray tell me. Wherefore are the lands shaped like a capsized and upturned net of Indra, which is composed of all sorts of jewels? Pray tell me why. Wherefore are the lands shaped in the form of a lute or a drum, like various flowers and fruits, like the sun and the moon which are so stainless? Pray tell me. Whence are the Buddhas of transformation? Whence are the Buddhas of maturity or recompense? Whence are the Buddhas who are endowed with transcendental knowledge of suchness? Pray tell me. Why does not one attain enlightenment in the world of desire? Pray tell me. What is the meaning of your being enlightened in the Aganista by shaking off all the passions? After my passing, who will be the upholder of the discipline or doctrine? How long should the teacher abide? How long should the teaching continue? How many sorts of established truths are there? And how many of philosophical views? Whence is morality? And what constitutes the being of a bhikshu? Pray tell me. What is meant by a state of revulsion or turning back? Whence is a state of imagelessness which is realized by the Pracheka Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Shravakas? By whom are the psychic powers of this world attained? What are the superworldly ones? By what means does the mind enter upon the seven stages? Pray tell me. How many kinds of brotherhood are there? And how does a dissension take place in a brotherhood? Whence are medical treatises for beings? Pray tell me. You say that you are among the Buddhas, Kashapa, Krakuchanda, and Kanakamuni. Tell me wherefore so, O great Muni. Whence is the doctrine that there is no ego soul in beings? Whence is the doctrine of eternity and of annihilation? Wherefore do you not everywhere announce the doctrine of mind only as the truth? What is meant by the forest of men and women? And by the forest of Karitaki and Amali? Whence are the mountains Kailasa, Chakravada, and Vajrasamanana? Among these, whence are the mountains decorated with various sorts of jewels and filled with rishis and gandharvas? Pray tell me. Hearing this, which constitutes the wonderful doctrine of the Mahayana, and also the most excellent heart of the Buddhas, the great hero, the Buddha, the one most excelled in the knowledge of the world, spoke thus, Well done, well done, O Mahaprajna Mahamati. Listen well, and I will tell you in order regarding your questions. Birth, no birth, nirvana, emptiness, transmigration, having no self-nature, Buddhas, sons of the Paramitas, the Shravakas, Bodhisattvas, the philosophers, those who are capable of formless deeds, the Meru, oceans, mountains, islands, and the earth, the stars, the sun, the moon, the philosophers, the Ashura, emancipations, the self-masteries, the psychic faculties, the jhanas, the samadhis, the extinctions, the supernatural powers, the elements of enlightenment and the paths, jhanas, the immeasurables, the aggregates, and the comings and goings, Samapatis, the extinctions, the stirrings of the mind, explanations in words, the citta, manas, and vijnanas, egolessness, the five dharmas, self-nature, the discriminating, the discriminated, the visible world, dualism, whence are they? Various forms of vehicles, families, born of gold, jewels, and pearls, the achantaka, the original elements, the wandering about, one Buddhahood, knowledge, the known, the marching, the attainment, and the existence and non-existence of beings? How are horses, elephants, deer caught? Pray tell me how. What is a proposition, a teaching established by the conjunction of reason and illustration? Whence is cause and effect, various errors, and also reason? Why the statement that there is nothing but mind? That there is no objective, literally seen world? That there is no ascending of the stages? Whence is the state of imagelessness and revulsion, which is a hundredfold? You tell me. Likewise, about medical treatises, arts, crafts, sciences, and teachings? And also, what are the measurements of the mountains, Sumeru, and the earth? What are the measurements of the ocean, moon, and sun? Tell me. 
How many particles of dust are there in the body of a being? How many of the coarser ones, of the finer ones, and of the middle ones? How many particles of dust in every land? How many in every danva? In measuring distance, how much is a hasta, a danu, a krosha, a yojana, a half yojana? How many of rabbit hairs, of window dust, louse eggs, and ram hairs of barley? How many grains of barley in a prastha? How many grains of barley in a half prastha? Likewise, how many in a drona, in a karya, a laksha, a koti, a vimvana? How many atoms are there in a mustard seed? How many mustard seeds are there in a rakshka? How many in a bean, in a dharana, in a mashaka? How many dharanas are there in a karsha? How many karshas in a pala? And how many palas are there in Mount Sumeru, which is a huge accumulation of masses? You should ask me thus, O son. Why do you ask me otherwise? How many atoms are there in the body of a Prachaka Buddha, of a Shravaka, of a Buddha, and of a Bodhisattva? Why do you not ask me in this wise? How many atoms are there at the top of a flame? How many atoms are in the wind? How many in each sense organ? How many in a pore of the skin, in the eyebrows? Whence are these men of immense wealth, kings, great sovereigns? How is the kingdom taken care of by them? And how about their emancipation? Tell me whence is prose and meter? Why is sexual desire universally cherished? Whence is the variety of foods and drinks? Whence the man-woman forest? Wherefore are the mountains of Vajra Samanana? Tell me whence, wherefore, are they like a vision, a dream, and a fata morgana? Whence is the arising of clouds? And whence do the seasons rise? Whence is the nature of taste? Whence is woman, man, and hermaphrodite? Whence are the adornments and the bodhisattvas? Ask me, O my son. Whence are the divine mountains embellished by the rishis and the gandharvas? Whence is the way of emancipation? Who is in bondage? By whom is he delivered? What is the state of one who practices tranquilization? What is transformation, and who are those philosophers? What is meant by non-existence, existence, and no effect? Whence arises the visible world? How can one be cleansed of false intellection? Whence does false intellection arise? Whence arises action, and whence its departure? Tell me. How does the extinction of thought take place, and what is meant by a samadhi? Who is the one that breaks through the triple world? What is the position? What is the body? Wherefore the doctrine that beings have no ego soul? What is meant by a teaching in accordance with the world? Do you ask me about the marks? Do you ask me about egolessness? Do you ask me about the womb? About the Nyaya philosophers, O son of the victor? How about eternalism and nihilism? How is the mind tranquilized? Again, how about speech, knowledge, morality, family, O son of the victor? What is meant by reasoning and illustrating? by master and disciple, by manifoldness of beings, food and drink, sky, intelligence, evil ones, and the statement that there is nothing but the thought constructed. What do you ask me concerning trees and vines, O son of the victor? What about diversity of lands, and about long penance the rishi? What is your family? Who is your master? You tell me, O son of the victor. Who are the people who are despised? How is it that in the yoga you do not attain enlightenment in the world of desire? but that in the Akanista there is realization. What do you ask me about reasoning? What about the psychic faculties belonging to this world and about the nature of a bhikshu? Do you ask me about Buddhas of transformation, Buddhas of maturity or recompense, about Buddhas of knowledge of suchness, and whence is the bodhisattva? You ask me, O son of the victor, about the lands that are devoid of light, resembling a lute, a drum, and a flower, and about the mind abiding on the seven stages? You can ask me such and many other questions which are in accordance with the marks of truth and free from erroneous views. I will instruct you as regards realization and its teaching. Listen to me intently. I will give you an explanation of the statements, O son. Listen to me in regard to the 108 statements as recounted by the Buddhas. At that moment, Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, said to the Blessed One, What is meant by the 108 statements? The Blessed One said, a statement concerning birth is no statement concerning birth. A statement concerning eternity is no statement concerning eternity. The topics thus are negated as follows. The characteristic marks, abiding and changing, moment, self-nature, emptiness, annihilation, mind, the middle, permanence, causation, cause, the passions, desire, means, contrivance, purity, 
inference or conclusion, illustration, a disciple, a master, a family, the triple vehicle, imagelessness, vows, the triple circle, form, duality of being and of non-being, bothness, the noble wisdom of self-realization, the bliss of the present world, lands, atoms, water, a bow, reality, numbers and mathematics, the psychic powers, the sky, clouds, the arts and crafts and sciences, the wind, the earth, thinking, thought constructions, self-nature, the aggregates, being, insight, nirvana, that which is known, the philosophers, disorder, a vision, a dream, a mirage, a reflection, a circle made in the dark by a firebrand, the city of the Gandharvas, the heavens, food and drink, sexuality, philosophical views, the paramitas, morality, the moon and the sun and stars, truth, effect, annihilation and origination, medical treatment, the characteristic marks, the limbs, arts and sciences, jhana, error, the seen world, protection, dynasty, rishi, kingdom, apprehension, treasure, explanation, the achantaka, man, woman, and hermaphrodite, taste, action, the body, false intellection, motives, sense organs, the samskrita, cause and effect, the kanista, the seasons, a luxuriant growth of trees, vines and shrubs, multiplicity, entering into the teaching, systems of morality, the bhikshus, the powers added by the Buddha, the lutes, these are the 108 statements recounted by the Buddhas of the past. At that moment, Mahamanti the Bodhisattva Mahasattva said again to the Blessed One, In how many ways, Blessed One, does the rise, abiding, and ceasing of the Vijnanas take place? The Blessed One replied, There are two ways, Mahamati, in which the rise, abiding, and ceasing of the Vijnanas take place, and this is not understood by the philosophers. That is to say, the ceasing takes place as regards continuation in form. In the rise of the Vijnanas, also, these two are recognizable. The rise as regards continuation, and the rise as regards form. In the abiding also, these two are discernible. The one taking place as regards continuation, and the other as regards form. Further, three modes are distinguishable in the Vijnanas. 1. The Vijnana as evolving. 2. The Vijnana as producing effects. And 3. The Vijnana as remaining in its original nature. Further, Mahamati, in the Vijnanas, which are said to be eight, two functions generally are distinguishable, the perceiving and the object discriminating. As a mirror reflects forms, Mahamati, the perceiving Vijnana perceives objects. Mahamati, between the two, the perceiving Vijnana and the object discriminating Vijnana, there is no difference. They are mutually conditioning. Then, Mahamati, the perceiving Vijnana functions because of transformations taking place in the mind, by reason of a mysterious habit energy, while Mahamati, the object discriminating Vijnana, functions because of the mind's discriminating and objective world and because of the habit energy accumulated by erroneous reasoning since beginningless time. Again, Mahamati, by the cessation of all the sense Vijnanas is meant the cessation of the Alaya Vijnanas variously accumulating habit energy, which is generated when unrealities are discriminated. This Mahamati is known as the cessation of the form aspect of the Vijnanas. Again, Mahamati, the cessation of the continuation aspect of the Vijnanas takes place in this wise. That is to say, Mahamati, when both that which supports the Vijnanas and that which is comprehended by the Vijnanas cease to function. By that which supports the Vijnanas is meant the habit energy or memory which has been accumulated by erroneous reasoning since beginningless time and by that which is comprehended by the Vijnanas is meant the objective world perceived and discriminated by the Vijnanas, which is, however, no more than mind itself. Mahamati, it is like a lump of clay and the particles of dust making up its substance. They are neither different nor not different. Again, it is like gold and various ornaments made of it. If Mahamati, the lump of clay, is different from its particles of dust, no lump will ever come out of them. But as it comes out of them, it is not different from the particles of dust. Again, if there is no difference between the two, the lump will be indistinguishable from its particles. Even so, Mahamati, if the evolving Vijnana are different from the Alaya Vijnana, even in its original form, the Alaya cannot be their cause. Again, if they are not different, the cessation of the evolving Vijnanas will mean the cessation of the Alaya Vijnana, but there is no cessation of its original form. Therefore, Mahamati, what ceases to function is not the alaya in its original self-form, but is the effect-producing form of the Vijnanas. When this original self-form ceases to exist, then there will indeed be the cessation of the alaya Vijnana. If, however, there is the cessation of the alaya Vijnana, 
this doctrine will in no wise differ from the nihilistic doctrine of the philosophers. This doctrine, Mahamati, as it is held by the philosophers, is this. When the grasping of an objective world ceases, the continuation of the Vijnanas is stopped, and, when there is no more of this continuation in the Vijnanas, the continuation that has been going on since beginningless time is also destroyed. Mahamati, the philosophers maintain that there is a first cause from which continuation takes place. They do not maintain that the eye vijnana arises from the interaction of form and light. They assume another cause. What is this cause, Mahamati? Their first cause is known as spirit, soul, lord, time, or atom. Again, Mahamati, there are seven kinds of self-nature. Collection, being, characteristic marks, elements, causality, conditionality, and perfection. Again, Mahamati, there are seven kinds of first principle, or highest reality, Paramartha. The world of thought, the world of knowledge, the world of superknowledge, the world of dualistic views, the world beyond dualistic views, the world beyond the bodhisattva stages, and a world where a Tathagata attains his self-realization. Mahamati, this is the self-nature, the first principle, the essence, which constitutes the being of the Tathagatas, Arhats, fully enlightened ones of the past, present, and future, whereby, perfecting things of this world and of a world beyond this, they, by means of a noble eye of transcendental wisdom, enter into various phases of existence, individual and general, and establish them. And what is thus established by them is not to be confused with the erroneous teachings generally held by the philosophers. Mahamati, what are these erroneous teachings accepted generally by the philosophers? Their error lies in this, that they do not recognize an objective world to be of mind itself, which is erroneously discriminated, and, not understanding the nature of the vijnanas, which are also no more than manifestations of the mind, like simple-minded ones that they are, they cherish the dualism of being and non-being, where there is but one self-nature and one first principle. Again, Mahamati, my teaching consists in the cessation of sufferings arising from the discrimination of the triple world, in the cessation of ignorance, desire, deed, and causality, and in the recognition that an objective world, like a vision, is the manifestation of mind itself. Mahamati, there are some Brahmins and Shramanas who assume something out of nothing, saying that there exists a substance which is bound up in causation and abides in time, and that the Skandhas, Datus, and Ayatanas have their genesis and continuation in causation, and, after thus existing, pass away. They are those, Mahamati, who hold a destructive and nihilistic view concerning such objects as continuation, activity, rising, breaking up, existence, nirvana, the path, karma, fruition, and truth. Why? Because they have not attained an intuitive understanding of the truth, because they have no fundamental insight of things. Mahamati, it is like a jar broken in pieces which is unable to function as a jar. Again, it is like a burnt seed which is incapable of sprouting. Even so, Mahamati, their skandhas, datus, and ayatanas, which they regard as subject to changes, are really incapable of uninterrupted transformation because their views do not originate from the perception of an objective world as a manifestation of mind itself, which is erroneously discriminated. If again, Mahamati, something comes out of nothing, and there is the rise of the vijnanas by reason of a combination of the three effect-producing causes, we can say the same of a non-existing thing, that a tortoise would grow hair and sands produce oil. As this is impossible, this proposition does not avail, it ends in affirming nothing. And, Mahamati, it follows that deed, work, and cause of which they speak will be of no use, and so also with their reference to being and non-being. Mahamati, when they argue that there is a combination of the three effect-producing causes, they do this by the principle of cause and effect, which is to say, by the principle that something comes out of something and not of nothing. And thus, there are such things as past, present, and future, and being and non-being. As long as they remain on their philosophic ground, their demonstration will be by means of their logic and textbooks, for the memory of erroneous intellection will ever cling to them. Thus Mahamati, simple-minded ones, poisoned by an erroneous view, declare the incorrect way of thinking taught by the ignorant to be the one presented by the all-knowing one. Again, Mahamati, there are some Brahmins and Shramanas who, recognizing that the external world, which is of mind itself, is seen as such owing to the discrimination and false intellection practiced since beginningless time, knowing that the world has no self-nature and has never been born, 
It is like a cloud, a ring produced by a firebrand, the castle of the Gandharvas, a vision, a mirage, the moon as reflected in the ocean, and a dream. That mind in itself has nothing to do with discrimination and causation, discourses of imagination, and terms of qualification. That body, property, and abode are objectifications of the Alia Vijnana, which is in itself above the dualism of subject and object. That the state of imagelessness, which is in compliance with the awakening of mind itself, is not affected by such changes as arising, abiding, and destruction. The Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, Mahamati, will before long attain the understanding that nirvana and samsara are one. Their conduct, Mahamati, will be in accordance with the effortless exhibition of a great loving heart that ingeniously contrives means of salvation, knowing that all beings have the nature of being like a vision or a reflection, and that there is one thing which is not bound by causation, being beyond the distinction of subject and object, and further seeing that there is nothing outside mind, and in accordance with a position of unconditionality, they will by degrees pass through the various stages of bodhisattvahood, and will experience the various states of samadhi, and will by virtue of their faith understand that the triple world is of mind itself, and thus understanding will attain the samadhi mayopama. The bodhisattvas entering into the state of imagelessness, where they see into the truth of mind only, arriving at the abode of the paramitas, and keeping themselves away from the thought of genesis, deed, and discipline, they will attain the samadhi Vajravimbopama, which is in compliance with the Tathagatakaya and with the transformations of suchness. After achieving a revulsion in the abode of the Vijnanas, Mahamati, they will gradually realize the Tathagatakaya, which is endowed with the powers, the psychic faculties, self-control, love, compassion, and means which can enter into all the Buddha lands and into the sanctuaries of the philosophers, and which is beyond the realm of citta mano mano vijnana. Therefore, Mahamati, these bodhisattva mahasattvas who wish, by following the Tathagatakaya to realize it, should exercise themselves in compliance with the truth of mind only, and desist from discriminating and reasoning erroneously on such notions as skandhas, datus, ayatanas, thought, causation, deed, discipline, and rising, abiding, and destruction. Perceiving that the triple existence is by reason of the habit energy of erroneous discrimination and false reasoning that has been going on since beginningless time, and also thinking of the state of Buddhahood which is imageless and unborn, the Bodhisattva will become thoroughly conversant with the noble truth of self-realization, will become a perfect master of his own mind, will conduct himself without effort, will be like a gem reflecting a variety of colors, will be able to assume the body of transformation, will be able to enter into the subtle minds of all beings, and, because of his firm belief in the truth of mind only, will by gradually ascending the stages become established in Buddhahood. Therefore, Mahamati, let the Bodhisattva Mahasattva be well disciplined in self-realization. Then, Mahamati said, Teach me, Blessed One, concerning that most subtle doctrine which explains the citta, manas, manovijnana, the five dharmas, the svabhavas, and the lakshanas which is put in practice by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, which is separated from the state of mind which recognizes a world as something outside mind itself, and which, breaking down all the so-called truths established by words and reasonings, constitutes the essence of the teachings of all the Buddhas. Pray teach this assembly headed by the Bodhisattvas gathering on Mount Malaya in the city of Lanka. Teach them regarding the Dharmakaya, which is praised by the Tathagatas and which is the realm of the Alaya Vijnana, which resembles the ocean with its waves. Then the Blessed One again, speaking to Mahamati the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, said this, The reasons whereby the eye consciousness arises are four. What are they? They are one, the clinging to an external world, not knowing that it is of mind itself. Two, the attaching to form and habit energy accumulated since beginningless time by false reasoning and erroneous views. Three, the self-nature inherent in the Vijnana. Four, the eagerness for multiple forms and appearances. By these four reasons, Mahamati, the waves of the evolving Vijnanas are stirred on the Alaya Vijnana, which resembles the waters of a flood. The same can be said of the other sense consciousnesses, as of the eye consciousness. This consciousness arises at once or by degrees in every sense organ, including its atoms and pores of the skin. The sense field is apprehended like a mirror reflecting objects, like the ocean swept over by a wind. Mahamati, similarly, the waves of the mind-ocean are stirred uninterruptedly by the wind of objectivity. 
cause, deed, and appearance condition one another inseparably. The functioning vijnanas and the original vijnana are thus inextricably bound up together. And because the self-nature of form, etc., is not comprehended, Mahamati, the system of the five consciousnesses, comes to function. Along with this system of the five vijnanas, there is what is known as manovijnana, i.e., the thinking function of consciousness, whereby the objective world is distinguished and individual appearances are distinctly determined, and in this the physical body has its genesis. But the manovijnana and other vijnanas have no thought that they are mutually conditioned, and that they grow out of their attachment to the discrimination which is applied to the projections of mind itself. Thus, the vijnanas go on functioning mutually related in a most intimate manner and discriminating a world of representations. As the vijnanas thus go on functioning without being conscious of their own doings, so the yogins, while entering upon a state of tranquilization, are not aware of the workings of the subtle habit energy or memory within themselves. For they think that they would enter upon a state of tranquilization by extinguishing the vijnanas. But in fact, they are in this state without extinguishing the vijnanas, which still subsist because the seeds of habit energy have not been extinguished, and what they imagine to be an extinction is really the non-functioning of the external world to which they are no more attached. So it is, Mahamati, with the subtle working of the Alya Vijnana, which, except for the Tathagata and those Bodhisattvas who are established on the stages, is not easy to comprehend, especially by those who practice the discipline belonging to the Shravakas, Prachekabuddhas, and philosophers. Even with their powers of Samadhi and transcendental knowledge, it is difficult to distinguish. Only those who, understanding fully all the aspects of the different stages of bodhisattvahood by the aid of their transcendental knowledge, acquiring a definite cognition as regards the meaning of the separate propositions, planting roots of goodness in the Buddha lands that know no limits, and keeping themselves away from the discriminations and false reasonings that arise from recognizing an external world, which is of mind itself, would retire into a secluded abode in the forest and devote themselves to the practice of the spiritual discipline, either high or low or middling. Only those are capable of obtaining an insight into the flowing of mind itself in a world of discrimination, of being baptized by the Buddhas living in the lands without limits, and of realizing the self-control, powers, psychic faculties, and samadhis. Surrounded by good friends and the Buddhas, Mahamati, they are capable of knowing the citta, manas, manovijnana, which are the discriminating agents of an external world whose self-nature is of mind itself. They are capable of crossing the ocean of birth and death, which arises by reason of deed, desire, and ignorance. For this reason, Mahamati, the yogins ought to exercise themselves in the discipline which has been given them by their good friends and the Buddhas. At that time, the Blessed One recited the following verses. Like waves that rise on the ocean stirred by the wind, dancing and without interruption, the Alaya ocean, in a similar manner, is constantly stirred by the winds of objectivity and is seen dancing about with the Vijnanas, which are the waves of multiplicity dark blue, red, and other colors, with salt, conch shell, milk, honey, fragrance of fruits and flowers, and rays of sunlight. They are neither different nor not different. The relation is like that between the ocean and its waves. So are the seven vijnanas joined with the citta. As the waves in their variety are stirred on the ocean, so in the alaya is produced a variety of what is known as the vijnanas. The citta, manas, and vijnanas are discriminated as regards their form, but in substance, the eight are not to be separated one from another, for there is neither qualified nor qualifying. As there is no distinction between the ocean and its waves, so in the citta there is no evolution of the vijnanas. Karma is accumulated by the citta, reflected upon by the manas, and recognized by the manovijnana, and the visible world is discriminated by the five vijnanas. Varieties of color such as dark blue, etc. are presented to our vijnana. Tell me, great Muni, how there are these varieties of color like waves on the ocean. There are no such varieties of color in the waves. It is for the sake of the simple-minded that the citta is said to be evolving as regards form. There is no such evolving in the citta itself, which is beyond comprehension. Where there is comprehension, there is that which comprehends, as in the case of waves and the ocean. Body, property, and abode are presented as such to our vijnanas, and thus they are seen as evolving in the same way as are the waves. The ocean is manifestly seen dancing in the state of waveness. How is it that the evolving of the alaya is not recognized by the intellect even as the ocean is? That the alaya is compared to the ocean is only for the sake of the discriminating intellect of the ignorant. The likeness of the waves in motion is only brought out by way of illustration. 
When the sun rises, it shines impartially on people high and low. So thou who art the light of the world shouldst announce the truth to the ignorant. How is it that in establishing thyself in the Dharma thou announcest not the truth? If the truth is announced by me, the truth is not in the mind. As the waves appear instantly on the ocean, or images in a mirror or a dream, so the mind is reflected in its own sense fields. Owing to a deficiency in conditions, the evolution of the Vijnanas takes place by degrees. The function of the Mano Vijnana is to recognize, and that of the Manas is to reflect upon. While to the five Vijnanas the actual world presents itself. There is no gradation when one is in a state of collectedness. Like unto a master of painting or his pupils, who arrange colors to produce a picture, I teach. The picture is not in the colors, nor in the canvas, nor in the plate. In order to make it attractive to all beings, a picture is presented in colors. What one teaches transgresses, for the truth is beyond words. Establishing myself in the Dharma, I preach the truth for the yogins. The truth is the state of self-realization and is beyond categories of discrimination. I teach it to the sons of the victorious. The teaching is not meant for the ignorant. What is seen as multitudinous is a vision which exists not. The teaching itself is thus variously given, subject to transgression. The teaching is no teaching whatever if it is not to the point in each case. According to the nature of a disease, the healer gives its medicine. Even so, the Buddhas teach beings in accordance with their mentalities. This is indeed not a mental realm to be reached by the philosophers and the shravakas. What is taught by the leaders is the realm of self-realization. Further, Mahamati, if the Bodhisattva should wish to understand fully that an external world to be subsumed under categories of discrimination, such as the grasping and the grasped, or the subject and the object, is of mind itself, let him be kept away from such hindrances as turmoil, social intercourse, and sleep. Let him be kept away from the treatises and writings of the philosophers, from things belonging to the vehicles of Shravakahood and Prachaka Buddhahood. Let the Bodhisattva Mahasattva be thoroughly acquainted with the objects of discrimination which are to be seen as of mind itself. Further, Mahamati, when a Bodhisattva Mahasattva establishes himself in the abode where he has gained a thorough understanding of mind by means of his transcendental knowledge, he should later discipline himself in the cultivation of noble wisdom in its triple aspect. What are these three aspects of noble wisdom, Mahamati, in which he has to discipline himself later? They are 1. Imagelessness 2. The power added by all Buddhas by reason of their original vows 3. The self-realization attained by noble wisdom Having mastered them, the yogin should abandon his knowledge of mind gained by means of transcendental wisdom, which still resembles a lame donkey, and entering upon the eighth stage of bodhisattvahood, he should further discipline himself in these three aspects of noble wisdom. Then again, Mahamati, the aspect of imagelessness comes forth when all beings belonging to the Shravakas and Prachaka Buddhas and philosophers are thoroughly mastered. Again, Mahamati, as to the power added, it comes from the original vows made by all the Buddhas. Again, Mahamati, as to the self-realization aspect of noble wisdom, it rises when a bodhisattva, detaching himself from viewing all things in their phenomenality, realizes the samadhi body, whereby he surveys the world as like unto a vision, and further goes on to the attainment of the Buddha stage. Mahamati, this is the triplicity of the noble life. Furnished with this triplicity, noble ones will attain the state of self-realization, which is the outcome of noble wisdom. For this reason, Mahamati, you should cultivate noble wisdom in its triple aspect. At that moment, Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, knowing what was going on in the minds of the Bodhisattvas who were gathered there, and empowered by the power added to him by all the Buddhas, asked the Blessed One concerning the doctrine known as examining into the reality of noble wisdom. Tell me, Blessed One, the doctrine of examining into the reality of noble wisdom, depending on which the 108 statements are to be distinguished, the doctrine depending on which the Tathagatas, Arhats, fully enlightened ones, will analyze and disclose the nature and course of false imagination for the sake of the bodhisattva mahasattvas who have fallen into the way of looking at things from their aspects of generality and individuality. Thus, the bodhisattvas will be instructed in the analysis and thorough examination of false imagination, and thereby, they will have the passage purified which leads to the egolessness of things and persons, and get an illumination on the stages of bodhisattvahood and further, going beyond the bliss of the tranquilizations belonging to all the Shravakas, Prachekabuddhas, and philosophers, will attain the Dharmakaya of the Tathagata, which belongs to the realm and course of Tathagatahood transcending thought 
and in which there is no rising of the five dharmas. That is to say, they will attain the Tathagata body, which is the dharma intimately bound up with the understanding born of transcendental knowledge, and which, entering into the realm of Maya, reaches all the Buddha lands, the heavenly mansions of Tushita, and the abode of the Akanista. Said the Blessed One, Mahamanti, there are some philosophers who are addicted to negativism, according to whose philosophical view the non-existence of the hare's horns is ascertained by means of the discriminating intellect which affirms that the self-nature of things ceases to exist with the destruction of their causes. And they say that all things are non-existent, just like the hare's horns. Again, Mahamati, there are others who, seeing distinctions existing in things as regards the elements, qualities, atoms, substances, formations, and positions, and, attached to the notion that the hare's horns are non-existent, assert that the bull has horns. There are, Mahamanti, those who have fallen into the dualistic way of thinking, being unable to comprehend the truth of mind only, the desire to discriminate a world which is of mind itself. Mahamanti, body, property, and abode have their existence only when measured in discrimination. The hare's horns neither are nor are not. No discrimination is to be made about them. So it is, Mahamati, with all things, of which neither being nor non-being can be predicated, have no discrimination about them. Again, Mahamati, those who have gone beyond being and non-being, no more cherish the thought that the hare has no horns, for they never think that the hare has no horns because of mutual reference, nor do they think that the bull has horns because no ultimate substance is to be attained, however minutely the analysis of the horns may go on even to the subtlest particle known as an atom. That is, the state in which noble wisdom is realized is beyond being and non-being. At that time, Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, said this to the Blessed One. Is it not this way, Blessed One, that, seeing how discrimination takes place, we proceed to refer this to the non-rising of discrimination and infer that the horns exist not? The Blessed One said, No, indeed, Mahamati, the non-existence of the horns has no reference to the non-rising of discrimination. Why is it not so? because there is discrimination owing to the idea of the horns. Indeed, depending upon the idea of the horns, Mahamati, discrimination takes place. And because of this dependence of discrimination upon the idea of the horns, Mahamati, and because of this relationship of dependence and apart from the Anyananya relationship, one talks of the non-existence of the hare's horns, surely not because of the reference to the horns of the bull. If again, Mahamati, discrimination is different from the hare's horns, it will not take place by reason of the horns, and therefore, the one is not different from the other. But if it is not different, there is a discrimination taking place by reason of the horns, and therefore, one is different from the other. However minutely the atoms are analyzed, no horn substance is obtainable. The notion of the horns itself is not available when thus reasoned, as neither of them, that is, the bulls nor the hares, are existent in reference to what should we talk of non-existence. Therefore, Mahamati, the reasoning by reference as regards the non-existence of the hare's horns is of no avail. The non-existence of the hare's horns is asserted in reference to their existence on the bull, but really a horn itself has no existence from the beginning, have therefore no discrimination about it. Mahamati, the dualism of being and non-being, as held by the philosophers, does not obtain as we see in the reasoning of horns. Again, Mahamati, there are other philosophers affected with erroneous views, who are attached to such notions as form, cause, and figure, not fully understanding the nature of space and seeing that space is disjoined from form, they proceed to discriminate about their separate existences. But, Mahamati, space is form, and, Mahamati, as space penetrates into form, form is space. To establish the relation of supporting and the supported, Mahamati, there obtains the separation of the two, space and form. Mahamati, when the elements begin to evolve, they are distinguishable one from another. They do not abide in space, and space is not non-existent in them. It is the same with the hare's horns, Mahamati, whose non-existence is asserted in reference to the bull's horns. But Mahamati, when the bull's horns are analyzed to their minutest atoms, which in turn are further analyzed, there is, after all, nothing to be known as atoms. The non-existence of what is to be affirmed in reference to what? As to the other things, too, this reasoning from reference does not hold true. At that time, again, the Blessed One said this to Mahamati, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. 
Mahamati, you should discard the views and discriminations that are concerned with the horns of a hare and a bull, with space and form. And also, Mahamati, let you and the other bodhisattvas reflect on the nature of discrimination which they have of the mind itself, and let them go into all the bodhisattva lands where they should disclose the way of disciplining themselves in the manifestations of mind itself. Thus concludes Chapter 2, Part 1 of the Lankavatara Sutra. So that was part one of chapter two of D.T. Suzuki's translation of the Lankavatara Sutra. Docs, what did you think? This one was pretty difficult to get through. There's a whole lot of terminology that comes up in this sutra. Beforehand, we redefined Vijnana and Alia Vijnana because they are so important for being able to understand what's going on here. But if we examine every term that I did not understand in this sutra, we will be here for hours, and I don't think anyone wants that. My basic process for reading this when I came across a term I didn't understand was to go, does this seem important enough to look up? Is this something that's just being said here, or is this something that comes up throughout the document? And one thing that comes up throughout the document that we do need to talk about, a quote-unquote mysterious habit energy. That's a weird way to translate that, uh, especially the word mysterious here. Like, that's a strange way for the Buddha who knows everything to, to refer to anything as being mysterious. So it seems based on context that when they're talking about habit energy, they're either talking about karma. This might be a weird way to translate the word karma. Or it's talking about mental inertia, our default way of thinking. Uh, any clarification on what's going on here? Absolutely, yeah. So to begin with the mysterious part, he's saying that it's mysterious because the vast majority of people, all unenlightened people, don't really understand how it works because it is, as you say, very closely related to karma. So it's mysterious because... Not everybody has the insight into the depth of causality that the Buddha himself has. Uh, so, it's, so it appears mysterious to everybody. And then you're right that it is like mental inertia, or in more technical terms, you could say that, you know, when we defined the Alaya Vijnana and how it stores and perfumes experiences based on these good, bad, or neutral karmic seeds, you could say that if you have 70% bad, 30% good then the overall tendency towards bad because of that majority is kind of like your habit energy. These karmic seeds that are stored in the Alaya Vijnana, the way that they come to fruit is through this habit energy. You realize them through your behaviors. And so part of the point of Chan, part of the point of Buddhism in general, is to interrupt that process so that you can prevent these seeds from becoming fruit because whenever a bad karmic seed becomes a bad karmic fruit and you have a bad karmic experience another bad karmic seed is planted so you, it's very easy to get trapped in a very vicious cycle where the majority of your seeds they're called bijas in sanskrit become these bad karmic things and so doing good acts or meditating or studying the sutras or hearing the Buddha preach, all these things interrupt the fruiting of bad and they plant good and they sort of change your overall tendency. It's, it's like saying whenever you know better, you do better. This is a matter of building up wisdom, building up compassion, building up good works, building up momentum in your life around being an overall selfless person and being an overall compassionate and wise person. Okay, so it's kind of our default way of thinking combined with karma at the same time. This habit energy is a bigger net than the word karma because it's inclusive of more than just past life karma. And I think that it's being a bigger net is why he went for it as a translation term. D.T. Suzuki was known to be very interested in Western psychology. And so a lot of the terms that he translates and localizes to are going to sound almost psychological. 
And so he's basically making karma be a factor of habit. And habit is not something that you can really understand or talk about according to its Western psychological definition with regards to like the people who originally authored this text and also with regards to pre-modern Buddhists. It's very complicated stuff. But that's just his agenda showing through. Well, it's his agenda, and it's also a matter of localization. By calling it mysterious habit energy, I don't know the context or the correct way to translate that from its original languages, but that term does parse to me as a Westerner who is familiar with Western psychology. So the agenda is there for sure. I suspect Mr. Suzuki is happy to make that link between Buddhism and psychology, but also as a Westerner who doesn't understand Eastern philosophy or terminology, by co-opting modern psychological terminology, he makes it a little easier for me to understand what he's going for here. Absolutely. So, like, yeah, there's a yellow card there. Like, there's definitely a matter of him wanting to present a specific version of Buddhism here, but it is also useful for understanding it. So there are problems with that kind of translation, but it's not a deal breaker because it is also useful. Yeah, for sure. All right. So the next point I wanted to pick out. So to begin this point, I am going to quote directly from the sutra. And this is the Buddha speaking. Quote, when this original self form ceases to exist, then there will indeed be the cessation of the Alaya Vajnana. If, however, there is the cessation of the Alaya Vajnana, this doctrine will in no wise differ from the nihilistic doctrine of the philosophers. So, what's going on here is an order of operations matter. So, as I understand, the Alaya Vajnana is the major point of continuity between multiple rebirths. So, if you cut off the Alia Vijnana before you cut off the regular Vijnana. What we have there is somebody who has cut off karma without selflessness in a way that makes everything else kind of not matter. Like this is I agree that this is a way to nihilism because if you still have the Vijnana but you don't have the Alia Vijnana, then This life is the only one that matters. There's no continuity between successive existences, and you're still there. So, yes, that is a a way towards nihilism by cutting off karma without cutting off oneself. Yeah, very much so. I think that it's an interesting sort of way of presenting the nihilistic philosophy in Buddhist terms. Yeah, he is. He's saying that if you seek out the cessation of the Alaya Vijnana without understanding that that is a process, like you say, of purifying bad karma, accruing good karma, and then dumping out the karma container altogether, he's saying that if you seek that extinction, then it's just nihilism. It's completely, you know, anathema to what the point is of the Alaya Vijnana in the first place. And he's also interestingly alluding to. This thing that's been interpreted by lots of Zen thinkers over time, but may not necessarily come out in the text itself, this idea that the Alaya Vijnana is part of a great universal one or singularity that is sort of shared and universal. So if we go one layer deeper from the eight Vijnanas beyond the Alaya Vijnana, there are some Zen thinkers who believe that behind that there's a foundation of like a singular pure consciousness which is shared by all sentient beings everywhere all the time and this edges into esoteric buddhist territory and it also edges into like wacky new age nonsense as well it's kind of hazily defined and it's not something that you can really strongly argue in at least this text for now but this idea is that the alaya vijnana itself may or may not cease, but it's not the final cessation kind of catapults you into nirvana. It kind of, its cessation opens the door to this foundation, this singularity, this universal one that I've been talking about. And this universal one is not karmic. So it's kind of an understanding of nirvana as being right here and now. 
again, I don't think this comes through in what we've been reading, but uh, this is definitely one way to interpret how the Alia Vijnana works and what happens whenever you stop having karma enter or come out of it. It's also a Hindu idea, isn't it? That we're a fragment of the universe and that eventually things combine back into one, right? This is, yeah, a part of Hindu philosophy. It's just that that universal one thing is not a foundation for the arising of the individual Alia Vijnana. This universal one is essentially what I'm saying is not the cause for our continued arising in samsara. But this universal one thing that this is referencing or alluding to kind of lightly is by these Zen thinkers later on in history to be the thing that causes us to both either be enlightened or to continue arising in samsara. It kind of falls apart because the idea is that there is this one universal mind that's here in samsara that's free from this thing, greed, poison, hatred, anger, free from karma, free from delusion and ignorance, and it still somehow opens the door for those things to occur. It's very complicated stuff, but whenever he alludes to that, he's sort of using that as a as an argumentative tool to direct one away from the nihilistic philosophy, because nihilism falls apart if such a thing is really true. It's also an echo of things we've talked about, like this is a non-dualistic idea that the separations between individuals are also non-dual, and so, you know, I am you and you are me kind of philosophy. This also, this idea of a singular, unified, and pure consciousness in this world, that kind of leads towards Vairachana, it seems like. I can see the seeds of several doctrines that we have talked about in previous episodes with this idea of the cosmic oneness. This seems like a seed point where a lot of other ideas grow from. It is, yeah. It's highly interpretive. And like I said, it does definitely edge into esoteric Buddhism. And one of the most interesting realms of Buddhology or study of the doctrines that are going on here is the intersection of Chan or Zen and esoteric stuff, because they sort of are going to read these things entirely differently but still very similarly to how Chan readers and Zen readers and Chan and Zen practitioners have made use of these texts over time as well. It sort of turns the whole thing on its head because this text kind of presents the Aliyah Vijnana as a bad thing. Having one is sort of your last obstacle to achieving Buddhahood or to achieving Nirvana. Filling it with seeds, good, bad, or neutral, is sort of the last obstacle. But in esoteric Buddhism, the Aliyah Vijnana becomes sort of an appendage or a piece or a manifestation of Vairachana himself. And so having one is no longer a bad thing. It's no longer a situation where filling it with good, bad, neutral seeds and letting those good, bad, neutral seeds come to fruit is seen as being as gravely bad as in Zen or Chan. It's a fascinating reversal of what's said here. It's a case, I think, of different people looking at the same thing and coming to different conclusions. Absolutely. So, one thing that comes up a lot in this sutra is talking about erroneous teachings of the philosophers. A huge through line in this document is that reasoning that is, the word we would use would be secular, but based in this world... A common way the Buddha in this document talks about why that is wrong is because they don't realize how much of what they are saying is coming from them instead of coming from the world. And this is something we've come up with several times elsewhere in the show. Discrete, rational thinking is not helpful in this kind of document. And I will say... That was definitely not helpful for trying to read it, because I spent a lot of time spinning my wheels trying to understand this, and that was not a productive use of my time, most of it. Yeah, exactly. It's true that the criticisms of the what we would now call secular philosophers is huge throughout this, and it's related, of course, to the advancement of the idea of the Alia Vijnana and how it works. 
So in my definition, I mentioned that these seeds come to fruit and that fruit is like an experience. But ultimately, you can also say that any way that a person understands and perceives and cognizes the world through any and or all of their six senses is an imposition of the Alia Vijnana, which is modulated or mediated through this habit energy that we talked about. And this introduces the doctrine of relativity. This is why water is like fire for pretas, but it gives us life. This is why they see blood or feces and they think, oh, this is a delicious meal, but we see it and we're disgusted and we can't live on it. So this doctrine of relativity is essential to Zen and to future types of Buddhism, like, of course, esoteric Buddhism, but also Pure Land Buddhism, all kinds of Mahayana Buddhisms that we've talked about before. And so the reason why they're wrong is because they're sort of trapped in their own relativity. They're spinning their wheels in their own singular, subjective, biased, perfumed or influenced experiences. I keep saying the word perfumed because that's how that's how the activity of the Alaya Vijnana is commonly translated into English because it's not like imposed, like covering something up in every case. It's more like it just makes it have a certain tint. It has a certain flavor. It has a certain hue to it. And so that's how we kind of understand how consciousness individually works between individual people. I think that for the most part, we can rely on the assumption that green looks like green to all people who can see and are not colorblind. It looks the same to each individual person, but their associations, their habit energy might change how it's interpreted, how it's cognized, how it affects their mind, how it affects their life in an ongoing process kind of way. And it's very close, but it's still relative and subjective and so on. So he's kind of dismantling their opinions. And essentially, it's kind of funny, my professors used to say that his response here is very much like the dude from The Big Lebowski. The philosophers will say stuff and he'll be like, that's just like your opinion, man. And the meaning behind it is that their opinion is so locked up in its own jar. And that jar is their own habits, energy, their own Alia Vijnana, their own subjective experience, which is not shared by anybody else. And also, which is imposed on the world by the Alia Vijnana and by their karma. So you can't really say it's anything for sure. And that anything that comes out of it is anything for sure, because it's so individual. Perfumed is a good verb for what's going on here. Not necessarily the one I would have come up with if I were translating it, but now that I've seen it, I absolutely understand what's going on. Perfume doesn't change the world necessarily, but it does add a flavor to everything. So that is the right verb for this, I think. Another part of this that the Buddha is attacking the philosophers on, and I think this is a spot where the Buddha has a very fair point, the phrasing the sutra uses is a tortoise that would grow hair and sands that produce oil, talking about things that aren't there that the philosophers are perceiving. And one spot where the philosophers are locked into their own thinking in a way that is holding them back is that they insist on an original cause. There has to be something that created the universe. And the Buddha says, no, that's like an effect without a cause. And the end of the universe would be a cause without an effect. And that does not happen in Buddhism. It can't happen in Buddhism. And I think even today, secular ideas cling to that too strong. Within our lifetimes, we are not going to have the data needed to understand how the universe was created insisting on that singular starting point, we have no evidence to actually make that insistence. Absolutely, yeah. And I like the imagery that he uses, the tortoise with hair and the sands that produce oil. That's that's very nice. That's good stuff. And so in other sutras, especially in the Pali Canon, we've heard Ananda ask the Buddha, what's the origin of the universe? What's the end of the universe? Where are all my dead relatives? Are they okay? He asks stuff like this of the Buddha all the time. And the Buddha will say, 
I don't want to talk about that, or that's just kind of a waste of my time. I'm talking about something else, or this is not something that you should worry about. But you don't get a real answer. And here we get a real answer. He's explaining that according to Buddhist causality, this is something that can't really happen. This is something that can't exist. We can't have an original creator, and we can't have a terminal ender or ending. And so their insistence on the necessity of that is, like he says, based entirely in this pathological need for there to be a fundamental, persistent, existent something, which would then violate impermanence. It would violate emptiness. And that's kind of why they're wrong, is because it's a self-based pathological desire, a self-based pathological need. If there is some sort of persistent, ongoing, existent something with an origin and an ending, then maybe they can plug their own individual capital S selves into that thing. That's what the Hindus try to do. And so he's like, you can't do any of that. None of that works. That's not how any of this is going to play out. And that whole thought process is completely fundamentally incongruent with how impermanence works and how causality works. Talking about secular philosophers, I would give quotation marks around the secular in this point, but going to Western philosophers, Descartes is going, I think, therefore I am. And the Buddha is going, what? No, that's incorrect. The self-nature inherent in the Vijnana is what is causing that. And so everything that comes after is flawed because of it. I think, therefore, I am is something that is kind of just taken as a single thing that is accepted in Western ideas. And that idea has not earned that kind of inherent acceptance. Basically, I agree with the Buddha here who would disagree with Descartes. Absolutely, yeah. Cognition experience does take place, and we need to acknowledge that and do something about it. But it certainly does not mean that there's a soul, that there's a capital S self that lasts for all eternity. You know, there's only relative continuity and there's only what's in front of our faces. And if we zoom out our perspective of what's in front of our faces, we come to the conclusion of impermanence. I don't think that there's any scientist or any really highly educated thinker or experimenter who would hear the claim about impermanence and be in disagreement with it. You know, I think that this is very widely verified by our individual experiences and also all data that we come to collect. Next, we start getting some attacks on the yogins. So first off, a yogin, I'm guessing that is a specific type of Hindu practitioner? Yeah, so the philosophers are people who are like Brahmins, they haven't renounced. We are calling them secular, but they're really not. They're Brahmanical, but they haven't renounced. They're priests. They're religious authorities in the community. And these yogins are renunciants. They're people who have left and are pursuing you know, realization with Brahman on their own. This is people who are exerting themselves through ascetic practices, through meditation, etc. So these folks are According to the claims in the Sutra, which this is Buddhists talking down on Hindus, so take a grain of salt with all of this, but it seems like what he's talking about here is that the yogins, the quote he uses is entering a state of tranquilization. So what the yogins are doing is shutting that down their perception of the outside world, turning it entirely inward, and... This doesn't work because they're turning inward towards a self. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so there's this misunderstanding going around that, okay, yeah, let's say this Aliyah Vijnana thing does exist. All we have to do is extinguish it. And one of the ways that it's thought of as possible to extinguish it is to shut the gates. This is kind of a direct translation. Shut the gates of all of the six senses. And once you do that, Nothing is entering, nothing is going out. So, therefore, everything must be purified, and you must be entirely 100% good to go. But the Buddha does not say to do that. He does not say to shut the gates of the senses. But these yogins, in a lot of cases, are doing that. They're not 
mutilating themselves in the sense that they're blinding themselves or they are damaging their skin unto being numb, but their renunciation, their hesitancy to be around anything, their goal of seeking the complete slowing down and cessation of all sensory information entering their bodies by finding a very quiet place and sitting very still and meditating really hard and all that stuff, it's not going to work because, like he says, they are sort of falling back on a foundation that is not there. They think that they're falling back on a true purified self, a foundation below the Alia Vijnana, which is individual and pure and free from all sensory issues, all sensory pleasures and displeasures. And they're entering states of tranquilization, like the Buddha says, like, this is a good thing. Tranquilization is not a bad thing. It's sort of what you want out of meditation in the Buddhist scheme. But their reasoning and their application are both flawed. The last major point I wanted to talk about is towards the end of this section, we start talking about the horns of a hare, or comparing the horns of a hare versus the horns of a bull. So discursive reasoning would say that we see horns on a bull. We do not see horns on a hare. Therefore, the hare's horn aren't present and the bull's horns are. It's a matter of relativity by saying, like, because we see a thing that exists in one place and the thing not existing in this other place, those things are the way they are and horns are a real thing. And the Buddha's takeaway here seems to be that basically it's tr he's trying to get at the fact that seeing things being different in two different places is not necessarily a sign of the way the universe works, I guess. It's not that important. The fact that the bull has horns and the hare doesn't have horns is relative and unimportant. Yeah, this is exactly it. Yeah, he's saying that, particularly these philosophers, they get caught up in this idea of something existing or not existing. They're like making these claims and they're making arguments based on their sensory information, right? And they're falsely making the claim that their sensory information implies something exists or doesn't. And the Buddha is trying to get to the very bottom of that assumption and say that because of this doctrine of relativity, which is not really named directly in this sutra, but is definitely something that you can pull out of this text, because of this doctrine of relativity, there is no such category of existing and no such category as non-existing. And to rely entirely on those categories is to spin your wheels. To rely entirely on those categories when trying to actually understand how the Dharma works, how the world works, how everything around you works, how you yourself work. If you get caught up on that, it's just not going to go anywhere. And so it's kind of an interesting argumentative strategy here because he's saying that when the philosophers are looking for an origin or an ending to the universe, they're looking for the horns of a hare. And so not only are they doing something that's fundamentally like incongruent with their own philosophy and incompatible with their own philosophy, but they're also kind of falling into this trap that he's now talking about, which is like, also, they're relying entirely on existing and non-existing, and that's not how things work. He's taking more and more steps beyond their philosophy to talk about why it's wheels being spun and why it's not making any progress. And it's very fascinating the way he uses this horn of a hare, sand that produces oil, tortoise with hair, sort of image to kind of discuss how their philosophies are self-defeating and also how they're completely ignorant of the fact that the Alia Vijnana is doing its thing. Self-defeating based on the Alia Vijnana, and also, even if it was true, it wouldn't necessarily be useful. I don't particularly care how the universe began. It's not going to affect my day-to-day -day life. It's not going to change how I interact with the world that exists. So not only are the philosophers spinning their wheels on looking for something that doesn't exist, but even if they found it, it wouldn't actually matter that much. In the Hindu system, it would matter to them if they did 
truly find it because that's sort of how they understand the ending point, the soteriology of all of their meditative practice and all of their study of texts. But I agree that in my own life, I don't care how it all began and I don't care how it all ends. I kind of care about what's happening right now. So those are the major points I wanted to get to. There are two minor ones that I want to bring up just kind of real quick. So first of all, we haven't talked a whole lot about Mr. Suzuki's attempt to Christianize this text. And mainly it's because we did that a lot in the previous episode for the Wonka Guitar Sutra. But I noticed the word baptized in this translation. For us, it was on page 91 capable of being baptized by the Buddhas living in the lands without limits. So, by the dictionary definition, that is correct. Like, if you look up the word baptized, one of the definitions used is suitable to what's going on here. But also, there are a dozen other words you could have picked, and that one it was definitely picked in an effort to draw a line between the Buddha and Jesus. That's blatant, and wave my finger disapprovingly at it. That That is a word with a lot of intention behind it. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that like there are several definitions to the word. It's very complicated, Yeah, and it's carried out in various different ways. But the truth is, us reading this now, and Westerners reading this in the past, when this translation came out, They were going to look at this and they were naturally going to think immediately of somebody being anointed with water or dunked in water, the common image that we all have of Christian baptism. And that's not the only kind of baptism, but that's the one that we were thinking of. And that's the one that he was obviously thinking of. And that one doesn't work in the sense that whenever this thing happens, that the sutra says happens, you become baptized by the Buddhas living in the lands without limits. They don't dump water on you. They don't dump you in water. They don't sprinkle oil or holy water on you at all. This is a translation and also sort of a shortening of what we've seen a million times before. A million Buddhas from a million Buddha lands will come and make offerings to you. And that offering sometimes includes water, but they don't put the water on you. They don't put the water on your skin in any way. They just give it to you. They set it in front of you. And so... This is sort of de-ritualizing Buddhism and sort of contextualizing its ritual into Christianity. This baptism thing, he's sort of stretching the definition to be something where somebody is done a ritual unto so that they go from being part of the out group to being part of the in group. And that's a level of religious advancement that you don't get otherwise. That definition is not really... It's not really what's happening in this event. When you join the the clan or the gotra, the word in Sanskrit is gotra, the clan of all the Buddhas, they don't do that. They just come and they walk around you three times. They bow and they'll offer food. They'll offer robes. They'll offer a bowl. They'll offer clean water, but they won't baptize you. This isn't you entering into a religious commitment. This isn't you entering into a religious community. This isn't you entering into a level of religious elite that this kind of implies. It's it's, it's very problematic. I I don't really like it. So I looked up baptize on dictionary.com while you were talking about that. And the second definition given is to cleanse spiritually, initiate or dedicate by purifying. So that definition does fit here. But it's kind of the same thing where we associate baptize with water in the same way that we associate immolation with fire. So when we did the self-immolation episodes, we made it clear that the word immolate actually means sacrifice. But because of the way it's usually done, which is by fire, we associate that word with fire the same way we associate the word baptize with water. So it's technically correct, but also intentionally and premeditatively aiming at something that is kind of deceptive. This is fun. I'm trying to think of how I would call this deception or not. It's it's right on that line where it's like, I'm spinning my wheels at this point. I kind of think of it as deceptive because the Buddhas are not doing the thing to you. Baptism, by that definition, assumes that 
this sort of purifying is being done to you. You're like a passive recipient of that purifying in some way. And whenever this event happens, you're sort of joining actively because of the result of your meditation and your study and your practice and your realization of the extent of the Alia Vijnana. And so they're coming to welcome you. They're coming to make offerings and sort of acknowledge that you're one of them, but they're not the ones that enter you into the community. You are the one that enters you in the community, if that makes sense. I meant for that to be a side point. So I think we can wrap that up by saying, we see what you're doing there, Mr. Suzuki, and it's not very good. Yeah, yeah. So one more minor point I want to talk about. At one point we're there, the Buddha is talking about isolating potential bodhisattvas and people on the path. And he says, quote, let him be kept away from such hindrances as turmoil, social intercourse, and sleep. So turmoil and social intercourse, I understand you're supposed to be secluded, but how serious are they taking avoiding sleep? Exactly. Or is that is that sleep the way we think of it? Or are they talking more of a dull mindset? There's ways that could be interpreted, and I'm not sure which one to use. And if it's literally sleep, like, what are they talking about doing here? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Of course, that people on the bodhisattva path, when they're practicing, they're meditating, when they're monastics, they are allowed to sleep. They are people, they're human beings, they need sleep. However, there's this understanding that whenever you become a fully realized bodhisattva, a bodhisattva mahasattva, like Avalokiteshvara, like Mahamati, Manjushri, like all of the ones that we know and have discussed on the show, whenever you become that level, sleep becomes an active hindrance to your being able to carry out your duty of saving all sentient beings. And because you have had these very deep realizations and you've accrued these supernatural powers and because the form and the factor of your body has changed, you can kind of go without sleep in order to be able to carry out these works 24-7. And so you're not going to be hindered by tiredness, by exhaustion, by sloth and torpor, these physical needs for food and water and so on that kind of keep us all in our human lives from being able to do everything all the time, you're able to go without those things because the importance of your task and the level of your realization has superseded those physical needs and your own power to overcome those physical needs has become such that you you can stay awake all the time. So it's thought that they're all constantly awake. They're not sleeping. Okay, so that's for the folks who have already gotten to the supernatural side of things. That makes sense. I'm just now realizing that we completely skipped the question assault at the beginning of this sutra, but it doesn't seem like there's that much to say about it. It's very clear that the message here is to pick your questions, kind of like asking that kind of rapid fire torrent of questions, many of which are not particularly important in the grand scheme of things. The Buddha just says, hey, stop that. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting part. And it's often skipped over for a few reasons. One reason is, of course, like the Buddha says, hey, stop that. But also, it's fascinating. This sutra comes relatively late in the production of these sutras in Pali and in Sanskrit. And it's thought of that this question assault is basically a very fast version of Mahamati asking about all the other sutra topics that have come before it, and then the Buddha giving more or less one-word answers for each of the questions. So it's almost like imagine if there was an inciting question to the first sermon, and an inciting question to every other sermon in the Pali Canon, and every other sermon in the Mahayana Canon up to this point. And these questions where there were similarities, they sort of condensed them into one, right? Because theoretically, over the course of his life, he preached 84,000 sermons. There's only 108 here, but imagine that they kind of condensed for, for brevity. Mahamati is basically saying, get me up to speed on everything else you've talked about up to this point. What have you said about you know the Four Noble Truths? What have you said about 
wisdom? What have you said about death? And on and on it goes. And the Buddha is like, we're talking about something else now. We need to get past this, but I'll give you this list. And so there is a point before we get into the Aliyah Vijnana stuff where he does have like a list of theoretically 108 things that he says. And they're just like one word answers. He's like suffering, wisdom, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very fascinating. You can't really draw a one-to-one match between every question and every answer. I tried. It was a huge waste of time. Yeah, it's not meant to work that way. But he is, in theory, answering all those questions according to how he has preached on them in the past. Yeah, we just kind of glided past that because it was the least important part of what's going on here. Yeah, spending way too much time in it is complete waste because... You can't even really point to any one of those question and answer combinations if you can even match them together very well, which is already hard, and then say, oh yeah, that's this sutra, that's that sutra, that's this sermon, that's that sermon. It doesn't work that way, but it is commonly interpreted to be like, Mahamati is here, he's theoretically filling in, so to speak, for Ananda, and Ananda has been the one who's been listening for the other times that the Buddha has preached, and so... Mahamati comes in and he's like, fill me in on what Ananda has been getting. And the Buddha very, very quickly and not not in a very easy to understand way, gives him one word answers to bring him up to speed. And because he's a Bodhisattva Mahasattva, he understands all of the answers to all of the questions that he got. And therefore, he's basically at the exact same level, for example, that Ananda might be thought of to be by this point in the chronology of the Buddha's life. All right, makes sense, and that is all I had. Was there anything you wanted to hit that I missed? I am good. In that case, I think we have an episode. This has been Chapter 2, Part 1 of D.T. Suzuki's translation of the Lankavatara Sutra. We hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Hi, Nick here. I just wanted to give a big thanks to Tanner, our first patron on Patreon. Just a reminder, if you would like to join him, you can find us at patreon.com slash brightonbuddhism, all one word. Thank you very much for backing us, and we hope you enjoy the show. My name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions and the voice of hearer. And I'm Docs, editor, question asker, producer, and voice of Hermit. And this has been Bright on Buddhism. Thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, or if you have a question you'd like for us to discuss, we'd love to hear from you. Please consider leaving a comment, a review, or subscribing, or joining us on social media. Email us at bright.on.buddhism at gmail.com, or find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash brightonbuddhism. As always, citations and resources for this episode can be found in the show notes. Thank you.